Thank you for coming on to the show. Uh, glad to have you on board. Why don't you go ahead and give me a little detailed information about who you are? Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. I, I'm excited to, to dig into my favorite topic today in name, image, and likeness. Um, but yeah, a little, little bit about me. I'm the name, image, and likeness specialist here at Open Doors. So my day-to-day -day is digging entirely into this new ecosystem and, and everything that goes into name, image, and likeness, from policy and rule changes and state laws down to what composes an NIL deal uh, and, and everything that we're seeing on both the brand side, the fan side, all the way to the athletes and, and how the deal creation process works. So. Uh, very familiar with with a lot of aspects of nil and, and have had a, an interesting route uh, as as you had likely gone over before just with previous history in the ncaa committee structure um, which ultimately led to the interim policy um, that the ncaa has right now so that's uh that's briefly what uh what what we're working with but i'm again excited to be on and excited to hear more of, of the questions that you've got Oh, well, that's great. What does NIL mean to the student athlete today for either him or her and their family? Yeah, so very simply put, name, image, and likeness uh, is the three identifying items of your rights of publicity. So these are things that are characteristic of you. It is your name, a nickname of yours, it's um, an image, it's a digitally rendered image, think of like a bitmoji or anything like that, uh, or even graphics created of you. So Everything that is you and, and that's identifiable of you could even be a jersey number um, attached with that. That is a person's name, image, and likeness. And what that means for your families, what that means for your athletes, is that uh, under a current uh, rule, under the the recent rule change, that's now monetizable. So athletes can now market themselves freely, uh, attaching the fact that they are an athlete, attaching. Uh, the again the, the rights of publicity that they have in their own name and market themselves that way. And while it seems very American and something that uh, should not be very very much of a rule change, it actually uh, within the last year has has made waves in the college sports industry and, and even at the high school level now too. So some of the most common questions in the recruiting visits are. You know, it's great to great to visit this university, but what does this university have planned for education and information around NIL? So it's a very common topic. Uh, a lot of athletes are exploring it, looking for ways to again monetize uh, what's what's true to them. You currently are employed with Open Doors, and what is it that Open Doors does to provide help to the student athlete? Yeah, so Open Doors will. Uh, we'll help athletes from A to Z when it comes to NIL. We help athletes build, monetize, and protect their name, image, and likeness. So uh, whether it's understanding the value that athletes have when it comes to deals, whether it's helping them uh, be equipped in posting content on social media, all the way to preparation um, when, it, when it comes to reporting and disclosure of NIL deals, Open Doors is the one-stop shop when it comes to name, image, and likeness opportunities. Growing up for parents that were both coaches, so you were able to, to see what it's like to be a coach's child and being able to play for both parents, which I don't think a lot of people get to do. Uh, being able to play football with your father while in high school and swimming while your mother was in college, is that right? Um, flip, flip flop. Dad flip -flop. for dad's college, mom for, uh, for high school. Okay, and at, that kind of formulated your interest into the administrative side of sports and how collegiate sports works. So how did you get drawn to start at Open Doors? Yeah, to, to be honest with you, uh, Open Doors was not, not a first pick. Uh, I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, born and raised in a very popular uh, sports tech company and Huddle is also headquartered here. So Every high school athlete in the country is using Huddle. They put it in their bio. It's, again, huge and, and a coincidence that they're in my hometown as well. And that's kind of the dream place to work. It's a, it's a cool startup-like environment. And I remember applying there and not, I mean, I got an interview. And after that, as an off job, I think I was thinking to myself, like, holy cow, I, I thought it was perfect for a role at a company like that. And I spoke with my 
a career counselor while I was in college and she, she said, have you heard of Open Doors? And I was like, no. <laughs> so I did some research, uh, applied for what was a data analyst role at the time. And as I was, I was a math major in undergrad, but had some experience there on the data side, but really as, as I couldn't have foreseen at that time, name, image, and likeness in the environment was picking up with the NCAA. So the first regulations, first, uh, first inquiries around name, image, and likeness, uh, rule changes were starting to pop up. And it was at that time with this company I'd recently started with Open Doors, they received a letter from the NCA in that summer of 2019 asking to provide some industry insight on the rule changes. Open Doors has been around for uh, the past, uh, at that point, it was the past eight years. So uh, Open Doors was an industry expert at the time. And, and seeing that the NCA was calling on them for some expertise in this space was pretty impressive. And I think that was one of the first main dominoes to fall in in uh in my experience here with nil and and starting to to shift my focus in my career away from the data side to more of that again specialty in in nil okay now with um nil being roughly two years old now because the clearance started during the pandemic uh how do you think that's going to influence in your opinion uh, college recruiting in the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah. So it's. Uh, I I think you're. We're coming off a very interesting uh, signing day in yesterday with the national letter of intents uh, and a lot of commitments coming in football. And where I see that impacting recruiting for the most part is is actually not too much different than current recruiting pitches. Now, something really important to note with name, image, likeness is that. Schools and coaches are not uh, they're, they're they're not allowed to offer athletes deals. They're not allowed to guarantee that an athlete is going to get X amount of dollars. Now, as you probably heard in the news, there's a lot of uh, gray area in that. You've heard of coaches sharing dollar amounts of what their athletes have earned, and while all that is a part of the recruiting process and could be seen as shady in some circumstances. That's again, not all that different from uh, the current recruiting process. So I want to take you back pre NIL to any sort of recruiting pitch given to an athlete. Take again, Alabama football, for example, if an athlete is being recruited by coach Saban, coach Saban can simply look back at his record, the track record of the team and say, look, we've won X number of national championships we have a successful program. We've sent out this many All-Americans, this many players have gone on to the pros. So when an athlete hears that or a recruit hears that, it's not guaranteeing them that they will win a national championship or become an All-American. But what that is saying is it's it's planting the seed to say, this is a place where you can be successful. And I think that's where a lot of the NIL recruiting pitches come into play, saying, look, we're not going to guarantee that you get any money here. But the NIL recruiting pitch is saying, look, we've had these athletes be successful at NIL. They've started these businesses. They've received opportunities from these major brands. And it's alluding to, again, that fact that at this school, you will be prepared for that next step in your life. Okay, I can see that. Now, to me, I would think that there's a lot incumbent upon the student athlete in doing these deals. What's there to protect them as far as... uh, Mm, we'll say shady characters. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know that's that's a good question because there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of gray area in this, and and unfortunately, there is not as much protection in this space that I think a lot of uh, a lot of folks would like. As there's compliance officers at every school, and they do their best job to equip student athletes and understanding the things to look out for. But a lot of schools and compliance officers are hamstring in the fact that they they can't in they can't be directly involved in the nil opportunity so an institution can provide some education at the beginning of the year um, but they won't ever in in most circumstances they won't directly advise an athlete on this is a deal you should or shouldn't do so a lot of the onus falls on the athlete which which can be hard um, but I mean, the best piece of advice to to go with there is to encourage student athletes to find those resources. Maybe they're at a point when when they 
think the best move is to get an agent for their NIL deals. Maybe it's consulting with their parents or trusted individuals in their circle. So um, there's, yeah, there's, there's still a lot to be developed in this space. And, and there, are, there are bad actors out there when it comes to looking to exploit student athletes, looking to, to make some quick money off of them. So uh, there, there definitely needs to be some keen awareness around what, what the important factors are of an NIL deal. Okay. Now, when you say an agent, uh, we're not talking about an agent that a student gets when they're going to declare for the draft or anything like that, right? Correct. So one key difference is that an NIL agent can only, think of it like a marketing rep, they can only uh, represent an athlete for deals, they can help them again understand the negotiation process and, and everything, even on the legal side of it, but they an NIL agent will not ever be in a position where they are trying to secure future professional playing opportunities for that athlete. So an, an athlete can have an agent for four years in college, but that's their NIL agent. And then when they graduate or go on to the next level, that's when they get a different agent involved, which is more of that traditional agent that we know of. Mm-hmm. Are, a lot of the, are a lot of the agents, are the houses that have agents, are they incorporating an NIL component in their agency so that they can like be able to do both or is it something that should be separate? Yeah. Yeah. There are a a lot of the major um, agencies out there. I think of CAA, Wasserman, uh, lots of those groups do have essentially a a new department found within their organization specific to NIL. So um, yeah, that, that was, that was a change that probably happened around July and August of this last year where they started to, uh, started to pick up on it and, and see the need and, and fill it themselves. So definitely a space that's going to continue to grow. But uh, interestingly enough, there's there's not as many athletes out there that do have NIL agents uh, simply because a lot of the NIL deals to this point have been, um, you know, you know they've been in the, the hundreds, the thousands, ten thousands. There there have been multi million dollar deals, but for the most part, if if you think about how an agent relationship is structured and they're taking you know take it 10 5 10 15 20 percent whatever their cut is that they're looking for uh, if the deal that a college athlete only does is a thousand dollars and the agent only walks away with 100 200 dollars that's not much for them to live off of so uh, as as it continues to develop uh, I'm, I'm sure the agencies are making sure that that they're selecting athletes who they believe will be the ones to bring in those multi multi-million dollar deals so that the agents again walk away with a bigger uh cut in this but that's that's one space where i've heard from agents themselves that that is a little that that makes them hesitate a bit about working in the nil space just because it's not as lucrative as as the professional playing opportunity space for the nil deals they're mainly a contract how does the student athlete um protect themselves in that contract because is the contract structure in a way is like you do so many commercial promotions for me and we'll pay you so much amount of money or is there a if the student athlete does something that brings this this credit upon themselves which would reflect badly on the company is it like that where they can terminate the contract and then terminate the funding is how's that structure yeah without getting too far into the weeds uh all the all the contracts are structured differently, uh, but for the most part, it is an exchange, and even required under name, image, and likeness rules is an exchange. So an athlete can't simply be paid money that's considered pay for play. So they have to do an activity in return, whether that's an autograph signing, paid social media post, uh, what you know, you name it. That exchange must occur in an NIL deal, and apart from that. Um, you know, brands brands are making sure that they're receiving some sort of ROI on their NIL uh, activity with the athlete. So they're making sure, again, the athlete is following through. And, and there are, again, clauses for the instance that an athlete does not follow through with what they've committed on. So, yeah, that's that's definitely, without getting too far into the weeds of the contract side, that's definitely something to uh, to point out. What are things that you've observed that are do's and don'ts for the student athlete? Yeah, I would say first off for, for the 
let, let's start with the don'ts and then go with the do. So uh, I would start by saying don't ignore the rules that are out there. There's very uh, there's very few coming from the NCAA. Uh, I I would encourage anyone uh, who's listening to this to go check out the NCAA's interim NIL policy. So so don't ignore that. Don't ignore what the school policies have been set forth. If you've decided on a school uh, or um, are, are thinking between a few schools, definitely check out those resources uh, because at the end of the day, the eligibility and, and what's being done on the field is the most important aspect to an athlete. That's what makes an athlete an athlete, right, is, is being able to play. So protecting that eligibility is super important, so don't ignore that. Um, I would also encourage an athlete, don't rush into every NIL deal that's thrown their way. There was a, a case early on in last July when um, it was a group of student athletes in the entire state of Florida. Uh, not sorry, excuse me, not the entire state of Florida, at an entire school down in Florida that were offered an NIL deal and within the contract for that, it restricted a student athlete from doing any NIL deal with any competitor of that business. So uh, the exclusivity clauses within these contracts, uh, if they're overlooked and if an athlete just jumps into the deal, could actually hurt the athlete quite a bit if they were ever interested in doing other NIL opportunities. So uh, again, don't rush into every deal you have. I would say on the flip side, the do's uh, is, is do understand your value as an athlete. Uh, you are already marketable, and you already have opportunities awaiting you. Uh, there's there's good opportunities out there, but a lot of it takes some some digging. So understanding your value, uh, not being afraid to ask for more or negotiate in an opportunity. I think that's all uh, right and fair when it comes to business uh, business ventures. So I would encourage that, and I would say lastly, uh, last recommendation would be to uh, make sure that you're pitching yourself. So kind of in line with the first one, but a lot of businesses right now are unaware of the rule change. There's a lot of businesses in a college town who would love to support the university and its athletes in any way, but they aren't educated on it. They just don't know about NIL. So making sure that you as an athlete take the chance to, to reach out to these businesses, if it's one that you're interested in, pitch yourself to them. Suggest you know, XYZ is your NIL opportunity offer to be uh, a brand ambassador to promote that business or that restaurant on social media. Uh, so so do do make sure that, that you put yourself out there and give yourself some opportunities because not every NIL deal is going to fall in your lap. You mentioned about the people out there that are wanting to work to help student athletes. And this brings up a question about uh, a thing I've heard called the NIL collectives. Can you give a little more information about that? Yeah, so NIL collectives are probably the biggest hot topic right now in the industry. And, and what they are is a collection, so hence, hence the name collective, um, a collection of donors or boosters or fans of a university that wanted to unify and create NIL opportunities for athletes uh, specific to their school. So it's, it's traditionally a lot, of, a lot of alum of a university uh, a lot of wealthy business owners, restaurant owners, fans, you know, you name it. And there's they, they've come to a point when they realize they can't create NIL opportunities directly for the athletes one-on-one, -on -one, or they've realized that it takes a lot of time. So what happens is one donor raises their hand and says, okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll make, I'll be in charge of this. I'll make a, an operation out of this. So that booster, that donor, whoever it is that raised their hand, likely will form an LLC, so a small company. And think of it like a small company operating where all the other fans who wanted to support the athletes will pitch in their money. It'll, again, collect into, think of just a, a pooling of money. And now that point person who's in charge, who's running that LLC or that operation, will then create opportunities for the athletes on the flip side of it. So that collective who's heading up the, the point person who's heading up the collective will coordinate uh, autograph signings for 100 of the players on the football team or schedule an appearance for the basketball team to show up and then pay out to the athletes based on them showing up or fulfilling the opportunity. So uh, where you've seen a lot of this in the news is 
uh, especially around universities like Texas A&M, who, you know, whether it's right or wrong or, or true or false, the, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars um, that are supposedly floating around at that university. There's other schools uh, whose donors have, again, just thrown money into this pot and said to the collective, I want you to get this to the athletes. So although the collectives are kind of seen as, uh, as cutting edge in this space and, and even viewed uh, a lot differently than they would have been viewed 5, 10, 15 years ago, they're, they're not the people hiding in the bushes. These people are now uh, out in the open and abiding by the rules. They're also uh, very, very much interested in securing the eligibility of athletes so they want to follow the rules uh, they're, they're not shady characters you know putting athletes in a in a bad position but but they want to make sure that their athletes are protected so that they can get it done on the field uh, and, and help their alma mater or whoever it is that, that they're supporting as, as the school so that that's kind of collectives in a nutshell and how they're how they're organized now can the collective actually go to a stu- a potential student athlete ahead of time how's that uh, how's that interaction with the student athlete take place yeah so uh, a a very cumbersome space is when it comes to prospective student athletes so the recruits high school recruits coming in or even transfer students um, that's one of uh, one of the few fence posts that the NCAA set up in saying that NIL opportunities are not to be an impermissible uh, recruiting inducement so the recruiting inducement means that the the fact that a school or a collective or anyone offered an athlete X amount of dollars or promised them something to attend their school. So, yeah, briefly saying the the collective, a fan, whoever it is, are they're not in a position to offer a prospective student athlete an NIL deal in advance of them actually enrolling or starting at the university. Okay, well, that's a that's a I lot guess of good I, information. Yeah, I, I would throw in there too. Uh, although that, it, although NIL opportunities are not to be a part of the recruiting process, uh, one space that's still transforming right now is the high school landscape. So there are states at the moment that allow high school athletes to monetize their NIL. So uh, within that space, Nebraska is one, for example, we had a high school athlete just two weeks ago sign an NIL deal uh, with a with a local restaurant. So there's opportunities for high school athletes. And I guess they would be prospective student athletes at that point too, to engage in NIL. Um, but again, if it becomes a part of the recruiting pitch, a promise, recruit inducement like that, that's when the student athlete begins risking their eligibility. Okay, so the ownership is still on the student athlete to basically know what what deal they can or cannot take. Yes. Okay. Um, do you know the uh, the other schools off the top of your head? So Nebraska, Alaska, Kansas, California, New Jersey, New York. There's about 15 high school associations at the moment that are on considering NIL changes within their membership. So I would expect uh, within the next three, three to four months that another eight eight to 10 states would be added to that list, changing their bylaws to allow high school athletes to to monetize their NIL. But the big part within uh, the the high school association, kind of the common trend is that a high school athlete can engage in an endorsement deal, but they're not allowed to recognize the school that they attend or wear their school uniform or anything like that. So there are a few restrictions around that. And if, if anyone's interested in uh, exploring those opportunities, I'd encourage you to to check out the rules with your local high school association. Okay, uh, open doors, like it says um, you. You just kind of told me what you do for it, but what does the company and hold do to represent the students, and does it act as a clearinghouse for the colleges? What's the interf- interf- uh, interaction between the student and the college? Yeah, within Open Doors, I'll explain Open Doors as if you know you're you're an athlete and you're a user downloading the app for the first time. So, as an athlete, you you can download Open Doors for free. There's no restrictions. Whether your school is associated or partnered with Open Doors or not, it's always free, always will be to athletes. And 
when you log into Open Doors, you have an opportunity to create a profile, uh, to be able to put yourself within what we've called uh, the marketplace. So think of it like an Airbnb model where instead of houses and apartments that are that are listed, it's now athletes. So fans, brands, whoever can log into the Open Doors marketplace, see what athletes are signed up and available, and they can pitch them deals in an instant. So by creating that profile, you as an athlete make yourself marketable. Uh, instantly, we've seen athletes take the link to their profile, put it in their bio, a lot like that huddle highlight link that that, uh, that athletes commonly uh, put in their bios. But um, on the flip side of that, again, as I, as I said before, not all NIL deals are, are just going to fall in the lap of an athlete. There's also an opportunity board. So athletes can see essentially uh, a job board of listings where companies have offered um, NIL opportunities to whichever athletes apply. So there's, there's a place to put your name in the hat as a candidate, hit apply now, and athletes can actively pitch themselves to businesses to be a part of NIL opportunities. So it goes both ways. It, it's, it's super cool that way. Um, but that's, that's what you'll see within Open Doors if, again, you, you just download it today, you create your profile, and, and you have no connection. Uh, now where it changes is if your college is partnered with Open Doors, and that allows the, the school's athletic staff to be able to send highlight, highlight uh, videos or, or pictures to the athlete to allow them to post that on social media. So there's a library of content there, uh, and, and there's also an opportunity for an athlete, again, if their school is partnered with them, f for them to be able to disclose their NIL deals to the school. So this is a way to um, keep, excuse me, to, to maintain compliance and allow for the athlete to, to have the peace of mind in knowing their NIL deal was reported to their school, which that's a requirement under most NIL state laws. Okay. Oh, that sounds that sounds like a lot of information for right now. Uh, I want to thank you again for coming, taking the time out of the day to be able to come here and do this podcast with me. Why don't you go ahead and give your contact information if somebody wants to get a hold of you? Yeah, definitely. Um, very accessible via email. Um, it's Braley.Keller at opendoors.com. So that's B-R-A-L-Y dot K-E-L-L-E-R uh, at opendoors, O-P-E-N-D-O-R-S-E dot com. Uh, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. It's at Braley Keller, B-R-A-L-Y-K-E-L-L-E-R. Braley, thank you very much again. I uh, hope you have a great day. I look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Appreciate you having me. Thanks again.